So I'm excited about the opportunities that God is uh, creating and uh, the new doors that God is opening. And also want to celebrate the second song that we've, uh, we've done today, Faithful, is a song that's been produced in-house. It's a song written by our own worship team. It's a Hope You See song. And I've been ta- telling the guys that we should do more often where we are producing our own song. So, all right, let's just close our eyes and let's get straight into the Word of God. I want you to ask God to speak to you today from His Word as uh, we look into His Word. Father, we thank you, God, for this opportunity, Lord. Holy Spirit, we pray. Give us eyes that can see into the spirit realm, Lord. Ears that can hear, O God. May your word become revelation, O God. And God, we pray that you would challenge us, transform us, and continue to build us, Father. We thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All the sermon notes are uploaded onto the YouVersion Bible app. It's a great app, you know, in case you're not using that, you can download that. Under the events section, we have all our sermon notes. Usually, we put in a lot more there than what we can actually cover on a Sunday morning. And for for people who are watching us online, on your online platform, there's a note section. Please take advantage of that. Well, today I want to talk about the power of prayer. And, uh, you know, there are some topics which I believe in the life of a church where you have to constantly bring them up and you know, teach, and I believe prayer is one of those subjects that needs to be taught, reminded, because, you know, we need to, it's always good to question ourselves to check on, you know, how our prayer life is. And sometimes we can get too familiar with a topic like this, our prayer, I've heard about it. You know, there's so many times, right from my childhood, you know, I've been taught to pray. And I know that there are people who are very diligent to pray at least three times, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, (laughs) hopefully. All right? So I'm not talking just about praying over a meal, but I'm talking about being consistent and being intentional about developing your prayer life in order to uh, develop your intimacy with God. Because prayer is a two-way traffic. It's not just a one-way traffic where you go with your to-do list and give it to God and say, you know, I want this, 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 and this by so-and-so date. And usually we do that. Nothing wrong in that, but if that's the only time, you know, you go into the presence of God only to tell God what to do, you know, there's a, it's, it's a dysfunctional relationship that we have with God. Because, you know, you know prayer life can be so, uh, so beautiful that you can actually listen from God, being, you can be led by God and through His Word, and also God reveals His will and His plan for us through prayer as well. It's one of the mediums through which God speaks to us. You know, God speaks to us and reveals his will through his word, dreams, visions, prophetic word, all right, and uh, by prayer where God speaks to you and kind of instills or, you know, inspires you uh, with the things that God God wants to reveal in our lives. So I'm going to talk about how it is important for us to have an attitude. There's a certain kind of an attitude that we need to develop for prayer. And we're going to look at what are the different types of prayer that the Bible actually teaches us. Because a lot of times we don't really know how to pray and what to pray and when to pray. Yeah. All right. And I've been, I've had so many funny experiences because, you know, a few years back, you know, I was teaching at a Bible college. And sometimes when you see all these, you know, Bible college students praying certain kinds of prayers, it's really funny. And, you know, the more you look at that and the more experiences you have of, of those, you think, man, we need to keep teaching on uh, the, you know, the, 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 pr- the, on prayer. And we need to teach on how to pray, what to pray, and when to pray. Because it's really important. It's almost like, you know, when a soldier is um, trained in a boot camp, you know, and then you give uh, different kinds of arms and artillery because they are told and taught what to use when. And sometimes Christians can be like these wild horses, all right? You know, you have all this faith and you're kind of praying all kinds of prayers all the time, you know, not, sometimes not really relevant to our kind of prayers. So we're going to look at this. So I want you to go with me to James chapter 5 and uh, let's read verse 6, 16. James 5 and verse 16. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. All right, and look at the second part of it. The effective, fervent prayer of a good man, righteous man, benefits much, avails much. 
There is something that the Bible actually is talking about. It says, uh, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. When you kind of read those scriptures, you say, you know, that, it's too high. I don't think it's for me. It's for somebody else, all right? And um, what it says, and if, you have to, if I have to paraphrase that in today's English, it says, God is saying, if there is somebody who can diligently develop a prayer to life, if there is somebody who is consistent to go into the presence of God with the same thing over and over again, and, you know, without giving up, it says it's going to benefit him a lot, or it's going to see the manifest manifestation of what you're praying for. That's what it says. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now, if you go to verse 17, it says, Elijah was a man with passions like us or a nature like us. Now, it's very interesting when you see, it says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, and then immediately it talks about, you know, James picks up an example from the Old Testament of one of the greatest prophets, Elijah. He says, Elijah was a man like you and I. Why would he say that? What's the context? What is he trying to get across? What's the point? He's trying to say that Elijah, a mighty prophet of God, you know, anointed by God, raised the dead, did some crazy miracles in the Bible. But when it comes to who he was, he was no special, no different than you and I. That's what he's saying. He, you know, he, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. Three and a half years, everything was shut up. Then he prays again, it rains. Why, would he, why is he making a point? The point is that God is saying it's not about who you are. It's not about how long you've been a Christian for. It's not about how matured you are or how, what kind of an expertise you have you know, in your walk with God. It's about a childlike, simple faith where people come into the presence of God, you know, put your trust in God and say, God, I need help, Lord, because he said, call unto me in the day of your trouble and I will answer you. There are scriptures after scriptures. Ask and it shall be given unto you. God is waiting on us for for us to ask of him, pray, because through prayer, we're not only telling God, but it is also a time to hear from God for God to reveal himself unto us. Now, let's look at why Elijah, Elijah was compared here. Elijah was a man with a nature like us. Now, let me take you back into the inconsistencies that Elijah had, because that kind of real relates us with. You know, one of the greatest things that people always look for, whether you go into a secular context or into a business context or into a spiritual context, where we, you know, we have all these success stories that we listen to. You know, I was this, but I became that. You know, I didn't have anything, and now I have everything. I was a nobody, today I'm a somebody. We all cheer up with the success. But what really pre people are in what people are really interested in is, is I want to know your stories of failure. I want to know how many times you failed, how many times you felt suicidal, how many times you want to give up. Because what happens is when people talk about that, we relate with that because a lot of times we are in that place of despondency where we want to relate and hook on to somebody's experience. And out of that, when I was consistent, this is what's happened. And I believe that's the context in which James brings this up to talk about Elijah. 1 Kings 7, 18 talks about uh, Elijah the prophet on Mount Carmel, you know, single-handedly destroys the 450 prophets of Baal. You remember the story, right? You don't see that in any of the modern-day movies, all right? One man, 450 prophets, wipes them out. A man of faith. Fire comes down. I mean, just think about it. You know, Elijah, fire coming down. All right, having this massive revival on Mount Carmel. You know, one man against 450, plus all the audience kind of cheering them up. And, and you know, they're, they're guards and nothing happens. People were cutting, you know, doing all kinds of crazy things. And Elijah steps in and says, all right, guys, move. And then he calls the God of uh, heaven. And then the and fire falls down, right? Now, the word goes out to Jezebel, who was kind of the, 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 the keeper of all these prophets. And she tells, tomorrow by this time, I'm going to do the same thing that you've done to my prophets. Bang, Elijah runs. And then he hides, uh, under, he sits under a, a tree, and now he's praying, Lord, why are you dealing with me like this? If you're going to continue to deal with me like this, would you please, what, kill me? Aren't you glad that God doesn't answer all our prayers? I mean, what would have happened a man who was on a mountaintop experience a day before kills 450 prophets and brings down fire from heaven. The next moment, his flesh takes on. All right, you see the, 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 the emotional inconsistencies of this man, and he runs now praying, begging God to kill him. I mean, he was not the only one. Numbers 11 talks about Moses. 
Moses delivers the children of Israel out of the land of slavery. Egypt brings them into the desert on the way to the promised land. And in the desert, you know, he already performed 10, ten plagues, miracles, split the Red Sea, miracle. And then now people are whining, complaining, and crying. You know, you can go back and read Numbers 11. Very interesting. Every man sitting at the entrance of his tent or at the, uh, at the entrance of his house and crying for what? Give us meat to eat. Now, we don't have time to go into all the details, but now Moses is really upset. I mean, he was leading like what? Um, uh, two million, two and a half million people. And he's saying, where am I going to get meat for all these people? You know, these guys are constantly whining, constantly complaining. And, you know, he now prays to God. He says, Lord, have I given birth to all these people that you asked, them, asked me to carry them as a nursing father? You know, where am I going to get meat for all these people? And now it, Mo Moses begins to have a low self-esteem. He says, if you're going to deal with me like this, kill me. I'm glad God doesn't answer all our prayers. Yeah. All right? Psalm 3. Yeah, very interesting if you read the New Living Translation. David is praying some dirty, hairy prayers. These are nothing spiritual. He says, Lord, slap my enemies on their cheek, Lord. Break the teeth of the wicked of God. I mean, some of you are looking as if I'm saying something new. You can go back and read Psalm 3, okay? And especially from New Living Translation. Now, David is playing this kind of... And sometimes, you know, we, we, our flesh comes out. You know, we see the inconsistent. The reason why God allowed these to be put into the Scriptures is so that we can learn and relate with the failures of some of these mighty men who were used by God. There's nothing special about them except for they recognized their failures and quick to repent and come back to align themselves with God and His Word and say, God, let your will be done in my life. Amen. So the reason why James brings that up is the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man will avail much. It's a very powerful scripture, all right? It's like very conf you can confess over it. It's saying, wow, 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 it's a great scripture. But it says Elijah was a man like you and I. You know, on one day he was on the mountaintop experience. The next day he's in the valley begging God to kill him. So what is it that God wants us to do? There is an attitude about prayer, and we need to learn about what to pray, when to pray, and how to pray. So we're going to look at the attitude. Go with me to Matthew chapter 6. And verse 5, Matthew 6, verse 5. Now, Jesus took offense when he saw people, you know, in this chapter, he talks about giving, praying, and fasting. So we're going to pick up the context of prayer. He says, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, uh, for they, do, they love to pray standing in churches or synagogues. And the corner of the streets, that they may be seen by men or heard by men, as surely I say to you, they already have got their reward. What Jesus was saying, now he was not against people standing up in public squares and praying. There's, he's not against people praying in public. He's not talking about that. In fact, I'm going to talk about there are times when you need to pray in private. There are times when you need to pray in public. There are times when you need somebody else to stand with you. There are times you need to isolate yourself to spend time in the presence of God. All right, what he's saying is the attitude, and he says that, you know, some people would love to pray and use these religious jargons or some of these, you know, big words. And uh, sometimes we think, wow, I can't pray like that. You know, it's almost intimidating to some of the new believers. I can't pray like them. And then we disqualify ourselves thinking that I can't go into the presence of God because I don't know the language of prayer or the, 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 the words that we use for prayer. And Jesus is saying the reason why some people do that, and now he's dealing with the attitude, okay, not necessarily uh, about the principle of praying in public. He's saying the attitude. The attitude is that he's praying in public and watching if people are watching him. So, wow, what a great prayer. Look at those words. My goodness, I can never pray like that. And when people applaud them, Jesus is saying, okay, you prayed. You were expecting me to answer your prayer, but your attitude, your motive was applause. You got it? That's the reward of your prayer. So what is he talking about? He's talking about there's an attitude. The attitude is a childlike faith to trust in God. Amen. To trust in God. It's not about the language. It's not about, you know, the, you know if there is a protocol, if you've you got to do X, Y, Z. It's not about that. You can, just, you can be riding on a motorbike. You can be praying. You can be driving in a car. You could be praying. You can be cooking. You can be praying. Because it's about connecting with God. And prayer has become so natural, or should become so natural that you are conversing with God. So we're going to look at the different kinds of prayers, and I've put in six in the notes. Probably I would get time to do only a few, all right? So let's look at the first one is the prayer of petition. 
The word petition is a judiciary term. Petition is you are bringing in your requirements. You know, it's, your, it's almost like your cry. All right, when you file a petition with the court, you're saying, well, this is my case. And you're saying, these are my needs, or this is what I'm going through, this is, this is where I need help, this is where I need justice, this is where I need your help. So prayer of petition is about bringing your personal request to God. Now, God wants us to pray for our personal needs, but that's not the only time you've got to pray. So if you look at the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, verse 9 through 13, it says, Our Father who art in heaven, and you go on, it says, Give us this day our daily bread. God wants us to pray for our needs. But a lot, sadly, we've only learned about to, to, to prepare a to-do list. It's almost like you walk into a super a grocery store and you kind of give the grocery store a list and then drop this, drop this into my cart and just take it back home. There is a time for us to pray for our personal needs, but there is an attitude. There's a, there, you know, and sometimes people struggle with how long should I pray for something before it manifests? Because... You know, you can't really put a time frame, but there is something that we can learn out of the prayer of petition to, it's between you and God, you know when exactly, you know, to how long you should pray for, and, uh, and how, you know, when you begin to move to the next, uh, next level or the next realm of prayer. So we're going to go to Philippians chapter uh, 4 and verse 6. Philippians 4 and verse 6, it says, be anxious for nothing, all right? But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. So now, we're going to break this down, okay? Can you leave the scripture on the screen, please? Be anxious for nothing. When anxiety hits you, pray. Right? You're, ang you're anxious about a news that you heard or something that you've seen or something that has um, changed in your circumstances, in your world. Pray. The best thing that you can do when an anxiety hits you, pray. All right, so be anxious for nothing, but in everything, with thanksgiving, with you know, prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. So what he's saying is that even your anxiety, there is an attitude that you come to God to pray, okay? And now I see that there are a lot of people who get upset with God. They're complaining to God. Nothing wrong in it. You know, you can read a lot of Psalms where David is complaining to God. He says, how long, Lord, should I wait? Come quickly, Lord. I don't know if you know some of these Psalms. You know, he's saying, Lord, come quickly, as if God is dragging himself all right, say, come on, Lord, hurry up. All right, nothing wrong sometimes for us to be expressional because he's our father. But if you leave your prayer closet with the same attitude, then you live with a stinking attitude. It's okay to come in upset, but when you leave, you've got to cast all your burdens, you know, have this divine exchange moment, and then walk away with, the, with this great knowing and assurance. Be anxious for nothing. When you're anxi anxious, when anxiety hits you, pray. And he says, with, uh, uh, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Now look at verse uh, 7. And the peace of God. Now, this is where I, I believe, you know, this is something that between you and God. You got to pray about a certain circumstance until you have the peace of God in your heart. Then you don't have to define or put timelines, okay? It's not like pray this prayer seven times in a day for seven days and your miracle will happen. No, no, it will not work like that. Because then you're only repeating without your, getting your hearts involved in it. Why was Jesus upset with the kind of prayers that they were praying? Because their hearts were not involved. Why was he upset when he saw people worshiping him in the church and he was saying, wow, these guys are worshiping me with their lips, but their hearts are, are thinking, they're, they're thinking of, about their lunch. Uh, I mean, you, we, can, we can be in that moment, right? You're worshiping God, thinking, where am I going to go for lunch today? The maid didn't come, so what about our lunch? <laughs> so Jesus took offense. Why? Because he's trying to teach us it's not about your prayer, it's not about your worship, it's not about your giving, it's not about your fasting, it's about the heart behind that. Get your hearts involved in it, right? And it says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and suppli uh, supplication and with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God until... The peace of God that surpasses or supersedes your natural reasoning rules and reigns your hearts and your minds. What is he saying? There are times when you keep praying, and as you're praying, you got to keep praying. And sometimes, you know, it can happen in a day. Sometimes it can take a year. It can take a few months. I don't know. It's just between you and God. Sometimes, you know, for some situations in my life, you know, I go into the prayer closet, and I, I'm praying, and I, bang, there is this peace in my heart. And when that peace comes, nothing has changed around me. Things look terrible as they are. But I have this unbelievable, unex uh, inexplicable 
a peace in my heart that I can't explain, that I can't tell about. You know, I can't tell you, but I know that it's going to happen. Because I know that I know that I know in my heart that it's going to happen. That's what he's talking about. You know, let your request be made known unto God and or until the peace of God that supersedes your natural reasoning. So keep praying until you have peace. Because the moment you have peace, then you step into what we call a prayer of faith or a prayer of thanksgiving. Because the Bible talks about you are thanking God until it is manifested. Now, classic example, in Daniel you would see, Daniel was fasting for three weeks, 21 days, and he was praying. And Michael comes up and says that I was, I was already on my way, but the prince of Persia, so he was talking about what happened in the heavenlies. He's saying, I already started, but there was this battle that was going on. And when the battle was on, Daniel kept praying. So you don't know what's happening in the spiritual realm, so you got to keep praying. You got to keep praying. Because when you, you pray until the peace of God comes into your heart. The moment you lose peace, you have anxiety. When anxiety comes in, it's a sign that you've lost your peace. Because peace is what keeps your heart settled to give thanks to God. Amen. All right, let's quickly go to the second one. It's called the prayer of agreement. Matthew 18 and verse 19, prayer of agreement. And these are the words of Jesus. And I say to you, if two of you agree concerning anything, it shall be done by my Father who is in heaven. Now the word anything is, has got some boundaries, anything that's revealed in his will, the revealed will of God, okay? Now sometimes I know that you want to you want to kill somebody and you want to pray like that, but God doesn't answer your prayer, right? Like David was praying, Lord, break the teeth of the wicked of God. Would you smite, uh, smack my enemies on their cheek, Lord? You know, he's praying. There's nothing wrong in praying, but God goes, are you done? Let's move on. All right? So a prayer of agreement is God is saying, now this is a prayer where you need somebody else. Prayer partners, life groups, that's why you got to be part of a life group. Or you got to be part of the prayer team. Or Sunday morning, just you know, a while ago we did that. Prayer of agreement is when you say yes, amen. The word amen means let it be so. Now in Corinthians, I think it's in 2 Corinthians, it says all the promises of God are yes and amen. So there are thousands of promises in the Bible. And when you're praying concerning anything, all right, for success or for blessing, career, marriage, or anything, all right, you have the God, God's revealed will in this book. If it's already revealed, then what you've got to do is you're saying, amen, let it be so. Also, the Bible talks about out of the mouth of two or more witnesses, a thing is established. Okay, out of the mouth of two or more witnesses, a thing is established. It's a spiritual law. Okay, now, even when you are praying, you know, when you're holding on to your promises, when you're praying, God has already spoken in his word. He's the first party. So when you actually pray, claiming that promise, you're the second party. Out of the mouth of two witnesses, a thing is established. Likewise, when you join with a friend or somebody else, and when you pray together, and as you're praying, somebody joins their faith with you and say, Amen. Yes, Lord, I believe in it, Lord. Let it be so, Lord. You know what he's saying? It shall be done by my Father who is in heaven. So there are times when you need to pray personally. There are times when you need somebody to stand with you and pray with you. Amen. Let's go to the third one. That's a prayer of intercession. The prayer of intercession is a prayer that you are praying for somebody else. It's not about you now. It's no longer about you. The spotlight is not on you. It's about somebody else. Ezekiel 22 and verse 30. Ezekiel 22 and verse 30, it says, and God is saying, I looked for a man uh, that they would stand in the gap before, before me and the land, but I found none. So what it says is God is waiting on somebody to bridge the gap. So prayer of intercession is you're praying on behalf of somebody, and sometimes the other person can be totally oblivious to it. All right? They have no clue of that. And, you know, one of the best things that you can do for your non-Christian friend in secret is pray for them. You don't have to announce to them. All right? Likewise, you can pray for your family, your relatives, your colleagues, your siblings, your parents, your neighbors, anybody. You know, a prayer of intercession is a responsibility or a, a, a burden that God puts on us to pray and intercede on behalf of somebody else. Now, God was saying, you know, through prophet Ezekiel, he's saying, I am looking for a man. And even today, it's the heart cry of a God. He wants to reach out to people. He wants to bless people. He wants to save people. He wants to heal people. He wants to deliver people. But he is looking for somebody to stand in the gap. So that's why when we pray a prayer of intercession, we are interceding on behalf of somebody else. So let's look at an example from Genesis chapter 18 
And uh, let's look at a few scriptures. Genesis 18, God reveals his plans to Abraham, saying he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis 18 and verse 17. <clears throat> 18, 17, and the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? God is, is thinking, all right? I'm going to reveal my plan to Abraham. So God, I mean, Sodom and Gomorrah, it was going crazy, all right? And God said, all right, I need to restart. I need to push the reset button. And so he tells Abraham, Abraham, this is what I'm going to do. Now Abraham thinks about his nephew Lot, who is now living in this land. You remember the time Abraham took over the plains of Jordan, Sodom and Gomorrah, he settles there. Now Abraham is negotiating with God. He's interceding for his nephew Lot, who was totally clueless of what was happening. Abraham didn't you know, call him up and say, hey, you better get down on your knees and pray. Now listen to this. The power of prayer is that you can stand in the gap and the other person too can be totally oblivious to it, but because of your prayer, God can bless, save, protect, or do something that you want God to do in their lives. So never undermine the power of prayer for somebody else. So now Abraham begins to negotiate with God. God, if there are 50 people, are you going to destroy? God says, mm, maybe I'm going to change my mind. What about 45? What about 40? And then he keeps you know, bringing, you know, he's, let's say it's like a negoti negotiation. He says, God, what about 10 people? I said, God, okay, get all those 10 people out and I'm going to destroy. And that's exactly what happens. God brings out Lot and his family and then he destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. Prayer of intercession. The next one that I want to spend a little time is called the prayer of warfare. Prayer of warfare is Matthew 18 and 18. Matthew 18 and verse 18. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What is God saying? You know, it's kind of sometimes you don't really understand. What he's saying, what is this whole binding and losing thing, okay? What he's saying, in other words, he's saying, whatever you allow on earth the heavens will back you up. Whatever you restrict, heavens will back you up. But what do I allow and restrict? All right? Now, Jesus taught the Lord's prayer to them. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Thy will be done on earth as it is already existing and governing in heaven. All right? Now, anything that is in line with the word of God, anything that is in line with the will of God, when the church or you and I, when we stand and say, I restrict this and I allow this, I restrict sickness, I restrict attack, and I speak healing, I release healing, all right? Now, that's what in that context God talks about it. Now, in order to understand a prayer of warfare, you've got to understand that it's not, uh, it's not a, a, a prayer... Um, uh, for the new believers, or unless you recognize uh, the authority that you have, you cannot step into that realm to do a prayer of warfare. Now, a prayer of warfare, uh, let's look at another scripture before I explain what it means. Go with me to 2 Corinthians 10, 3. For even though we walk in the flesh, a natural world, we do not wage a war ag according to the flesh. All right? Even though we live in this world, we are not fighting against one another. So, now that tells us that we can never pray against another person. Don't pray for, to God, Lord, destroy these people, Lord. I, I heard some people pray that prayer. It's a wrong prayer. I mean, you can continue to pray. You're wasting your time. All right? So, you're not called to pray against another person, but you can surely pray against the spirit that operates through them. All right? So... Now, go to another scripture. It really helps us to go to verse 4 of the same chapter. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or natural, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of the strongholds. Okay? So what we are engaging in is not a natural battle, but a spiritual battle. The people, uh, beg your pardon, the spirit behind the people. All right? Now, go to Ephesians 6, 12. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Now, what he's talking about is a prayer of warfare is a prayer that you recognize the authority that you have. Mark 16, Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. I now give it to you. Therefore, go and make disciples. All right? And it says, um, you know, when you lay hands on the sick, they will recover as part of, knowing your authority. 
if you drink anything deadly, it will not hurt you, and so on and so forth. So what is he talking about? He's talking about there is an authority that we recognize, okay? Now listen to this very carefully. There are times when we pray to God. Example, Jesus woke up early in the morning, went into the mountains and prayed to God. Through the day, he dispensed the authority, the power by moving in the authority that he knew he had. All right? Now listen to this. There is nothing wrong in praying to God. There are things that God wants us to pray uh, and handle things while we are looking to God and saying, can you do that for me, please? And God is saying, you do that because I have empowered you. So prayer of warfare is not an elementary prayer. It's a prayer where you recognize the, your authority. That's why, especially when you're praying against some spiritual battles, when you're praying against some certain things, you're praying, you know, for our weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So you recognize that I can speak to the spirit behind it. When Jesus was dealing with the demented people, he, you know, they were talking. He said, what's your name? My name is Legion. And then he says, come out. What, who was he talking? He was talking to the demonic world. Likewise, Jesus, one day he was hungry, walking, and saw a fig tree, and he spoke to the fig tree. You remember that? It's weird, right? You, when, you look, when you're talking to trees, you need medical help. You need mental help. But spiritually, you need to recognize that there is an authority. That's why when he was traveling in the boat, when there was a storm, all right, the disciples wake him up saying, Lord, don't you care we perish? He gets onto the deck of the boat, and he speaks to the storm. And the Bible records, who is this? That even the nature obeys him. That's the power and the authority that you as a believer have. It's not about us, right? It's not about us. You know, it's not about, not, there's nothing special about us. But the moment you step in your authority, you cover yourself under that name. That's why Philippians says, for we have this name that has been given to us. There is no other name in heaven, on earth, under the earth. At this name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. So what you do, you recognize, Lord, I can do this in my own strength, Lord, but the moment I step and exercise my authority, I step into my authority, Lord, I know that the whole heaven is backing me up. And now I don't say, I bind you in Jesus' name in my own strength. I recognize the authority. All right? You know, it's, it's like this. Now you're saying, you know, you have your moment of praying, being filled with the Spirit of God, the power of God, and now you're dispensing that power. That comes as a result of recognizing your authority, and you know that God has empowered you. Amen? I hope you remember the story from the book of Acts, the sons of Sceva. They saw Paul deal with the demonic world. And now they imitate him and says, in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches, we command you. They were praying for a demented guy. And the demon responds, Paul I know, Jesus I know, who are you? And you know the story? They start beating them up. They run naked, torn clothes. So what is it? It is not about using a name. It's about recognizing the authority. Whatever you bind on earth, sickness is not from God. Lord, we bind it in Jesus' name. And the whole heaven backs you up. I release healing, divine health. The whole heaven backs you up. Amen? There are times when you pray to God. There are times when you pray to your circumstances. In the book of Ezekiel, God tells Ezekiel, when he takes him into a valley of dry bones, he says, prophesy, speak to these dry bones. I mean, it's crazy, right? You know, when you start speaking to things, but that's the authority we have to speak into our circumstances. So church, this morning, I want you to feel empowered that God has empowered you. It's not our strength. It's not about our qualification. If you think I've been a Christian for 20 years because of that, I have strength, you lost it. All you got to recognize is, I can't, but in Jesus' name, I can. Amen? Come on, let's all stand to our feet. I want to pray with you right now. I wanted to just close your eyes and uh, 
Just stretch forth your hands. And I know that, that you know, each one of you, you have your own battles. You're, you know, you're fighting some things. You're praying about things. You know, you're, you're constantly engaging yourself in prayer. And sometimes there's an anxiety that's kind of rising up in your heart. Can we take a moment right now? Can you guys just probably just do some music? You know, can you just uh, start praying, you know, a prayer of warfare, you know, just under your breath. Or you can just, you know, very softly say, God, I've been praying about this, Lord. And in Jesus' name, Lord, I bind the spirit, the things that are working behind what I see, Lord. And I speak and I release peace, healing, deliverance, whatever, you know. Can we just take a moment right now? Just stretch forth your hands, everybody. Just lift up your hands. You know, I want you to just think about one of the, you know, what is your pressing need today? You know, my need can be very different to your needs, but in your own world, you know, they, are, they mean a lot to you. And if there is something that's really pressing against you, I believe that it's a breakthrough moment right now. I believe that there is this atmosphere that's been created as the, by the preaching of the word. It's an atmosphere of faith where you can speak into your own circumstances and you can begin to pray. So would you please lift up your hands and just begin to pray. Father, we thank you, God, for your word, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, Lord, for speaking to us, for teaching us, Lord, this morning, Father. And God, we take authority, Lord. If there is somebody who's struggling with sickness, Lord, Father, we bind that spirit behind them, the spirit of sickness, Lord, in Jesus. Now, I speak healing, Lord. Lord, I, I just believe that there is somebody who's engaged in a legal battle. You know, it's all, I think it's about a property. I just believe that God is showing to me like that, you know, that you are kind of depending on God. And I believe God is saying, just begin to speak into your circumstances. Say, you know, victory belongs to you. God vindicates you. He's your just God. He brings justice to you. So God, we thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, people who are watching us online, Father, or even a recorded version at a later point of time, Father, I pray, Father, if there's anybody who's afflicted by a demonic work, oh Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, we speak deliverance, Lord, to come through, Father. In Jesus' name of God. We thank you, God. Father, we thank you for your word, Lord, this morning. Come, Holy Spirit. May the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding the joy that is inexplicable, Lord, descend upon our hearts right now, Father. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. I want to give an opportunity to anybody who's never made a commitment to follow Jesus. Maybe you're visiting with us for the first time, or you've been coming to church for some time, or maybe you're watching us online. The Bible says that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and for my sins. All we got to do is we don't have to do any sacrifice. We don't have to do any penance. All we got to do is believe in our heart and we've got to confess with our mouth. So today, if you can surrender your life to Jesus, you will have a new beginning in your life. So if there's anyone like that, would you repeat this prayer after me? Even though people watching online, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for speaking to me. I make a choice to surrender my life to you. I believe that Jesus died for my sins, and I make him my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name. Father, I will thank you, God, for your... For these people who made this decision, Lord, bless them, Father. Father, I speak your blessing upon your people, Lord, even through this week, Lord. May your divine protection continue to go with us, Lord. Prosper your people, Lord. Let success be their portion of God. We thank you, God, in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. Come on, give him praise one more time for his word this morning.